Uh, next up, we have Manira Mertzer. Thank you. Um, I just want to say it's so wonderful to be in a room with more than 10 people who voted leave in London, which <laughs> I have to say I don't think I've had before. Um, but it's uh, fantastic that this event has been organised, and um, I agree with um, so much of what's been said already. I, I loved the referendum. I loved the campaign. Um, for anyone who's been involved in politics for um, the last... Uh, 10 years or 20 years, it was incredibly invigorating and powerful to be watching primetime television, ITV, on a Friday night, politicians, members of the public talking about democracy and sovereignty. I mean, it's just an extraordinary thing. And it was, I think, actually quite a high-level debate. There were lots of people who, at the time, and even now are saying very sniffily, oh, well, you know, there were no facts, and uh, oh, the, lo the campaigns lied, and there was all this sort of uh, uh, dishonesty, and people were fooled. And actually, I thought the content and the arguments were quite rich. There was a huge amount of stuff in the media, lots of blogs, lots of public events, 10,000 activists for the Leave campaign, um, which is an incredible mobilization, actually. I think that was uh, brilliant. And many of those people, most of those people, motivated by democracy, not by fear, not by hatred or xenophobia, but a genuine passion for the ideas. And so I, I think it was a, a fantastic experience. And that's why it's all the more galling that the reaction to it was so negative from uh, people um, in, in parts of the political establishment after the vote. And when I felt a sense of pride that the British people had voted uh, against fear, and, and despite the fact that they would be warned it would be against their economic interests, that they still voted um, to leave the EU, that all these people would then say, well, it's just because they were stupid or thick or racist, and you know, all the things that have been said already. Um, there were many people who would want to question the uh, motives of those who voted leave, as if the motives of those who voted remain were incredibly rational and thoughtful and well-informed as well. And, and I think that uh, that was a very easy caricature for a lot of people to make. Um, uh, in my view, it wasn't a howl of rage. It may have been for some people, but by and large, it was actually a decision people made, weighing up the arguments, often in their rational self-interest. And it was a very good example of why democracy is uh, fundamentally uh, a powerful and uh, a, a, a good thing, a morally good thing in a society because it gives people control over their own destiny. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, terrible that so many people uh, reacted so badly against it. If we didn't think before the vote that there was a, uh, an anti-democratic strain in our public life, we certainly knew it afterwards by the way that, that people expose themselves. In terms of what to do next, and I think that uh, having spoken to many people uh, who voted Remain, um, clearly there were those who were horrified and you know, have um, uh, canceled friendships uh, as a result, some of them my own friends, um, but many people I think who voted Remain have also said that this is the decision of the British people, and actually, you know, we're now going to try and be pragmatic and make it work. And uh, and I think that that is important. That there are lots of people on the other side, the Remain side, who um, who want to do that. And I, I think we should uh, be more than just the 17 million. We're 17 million plus, and there will be some people who will see that the sky didn't fall in, and that they also want to uh, uh, think again about the EU. Um, and there are many people, of course, who voted Remain who. Um, uh, realize now that maybe it wasn't so scary uh, and, and you know, we can make it work. I think that it's brilliant to have public campaigns putting pressure on the government uh, to, to leave um, and, uh, and I can understand people's anxiety and concern to want to invoke Article 50 straight away. My own view is that there is a, you know, a sensible reason actually uh, to uh, defer that, uh, uh, that, that procedure until informal negotiations have taken place with the EU. There is a risk, of course, that the EU decides to come back with a better offer, but I do think that there is a, a, a reasonable tactical uh, position there. And I, what I would be reluctant to say is that those people who are talking about waiting and doing it towards the end of this year are anti-democratic. I think many of the people, um, many of the politicians who are saying that, who have 
given a huge amount, who are very committed to Brexit. Um, I don't think we should doubt their conviction uh, uh, and their, their reason for doing that. But I absolutely agree that it's important to put pressure on. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm certainly, uh, I think we should watch that space um, and, and see whether it should be involved. There may be alternatives to Article 50 as well. There are other legal procedures, uh, uh, legislation that we can ourselves uh, put in place in the British uh, Parliament. Um, but that's all technical stuff. I think the, the fundamental thing is we want constant public commitment from government that they will enact the people's will, constant public pressure, and I think the 10,000 activists and more who supported the official campaign and the many other groups that weren't in the official campaign need to keep having public events and keep making their voice heard because despite what many people say, we don't regret our vote, we're very proud of it, and you know, we, would, we would do the same again tomorrow if we were given the choice.